Okay. Um, <clears throat> we, we left off basically with uh, what the different beliefs in baptism, which is a defining point of many of our uh, religious be beliefs, especially for Baptists, since we're called Baptists. Uh, we have a, a very uh, uh, good definition based on uh, the Greek word baptizo uh, that uh, uh, means to immerse, means to uh, cleanse. Um, so when we see what uh, the different beliefs are among the major denominations in uh, Christianity are, um, now why do you think we came up with these different beliefs? Why was it that way? Um, I'm going to go into this next section, different beliefs on the authority of scripture and the books of the Bible that compose the actual canon. Okay, so we have some differences there, and this there's a lot of allowance now that occurs because of that, uh, and I think this is what spawns what we have with baptism and, and many other beliefs. Let's start with Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism believes that the scriptures teach without error the truth needed for our salvation. Scripture must be within the tradition of the church. You notice I have that as the uh, underlined. Final authority. This, uh, the canon includes 46 books of the, uh, for the Old Testament, including the canonical books of the Apocrypha and 27 books of the New Testament. So, let's stop there. Think about that. We have different books that are included in the Old Testament. Now, why do you think that occurred? Anybody understand the history of that? Where did that come from? <clears throat> you mean the, the addition of the, the Of the addition book, uh, additional books. Where did it first start? Go with that. Um, with the, the, the when the, the when the Old Testament was put into Greek, okay, it was it was written in Aramaic and Hebrew, um, but there was a translation that went over. When did that occur? Okay, so I'm going to give you some history here. In when Alexander the Great conquered that known territory of uh, Palestine and. Persia and everything. It was what entered into the uh, world as what they call the Hellenistic period. Okay, meaning that it was a Greek influence on everything. In, uh, remember there was a famous library in Alexandria, Egypt. The famous library of Alexandria, which was one of the seven wonders of the world where they had all these texts from all these different cultures and everything else like that. In other words, they believed in, the Greeks basically said, you know, we, we want to include everything. We want all thoughts. We want everything. Even though, you know, you're a conquered people, we still want to know your culture and everything. So they had 70 Hebrew scholars that knew Greek, translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek. It was called the Septuagint. Anybody know that name? Septuagint, for 70, basically. Septuagint included these apocryphal books as a part of the historical record of what was happening up through that period of time when they did, when they did the translation. When was that? It was probably about, I'm I don't know the exact, exact date, but I know it's probably before the Romans conquered because it was the Romans conquered uh, uh, Palestine in 44 uh, BC, so we have, you know, other things going on before that. So it'd be probably that hundred years before that 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 took place. Okay, in in that period of time, um, the and it really remember the from Malachi to Matthew, there's about a 400 year gap. Okay, and so at that point in time, even though the Jews never used those books as their Bible. It was called the Palestinian Bible, which is our Old Testament 39 books. Okay, divided up a different way and, and, and 
you know, they were on scrolls and everything else like that. So, like first and second kings was all one. You know, it was all one. wasn't considered uh, a different, two different books, but things of that, things of that nature. Uh, but when the uh, when it's translated over, they included these books, these other books that were a part of the history of Israel, sort of trying to fill the gap. Okay, that's what scholars believe that was trying to fill the gap. Not necessarily was it to be included in scripture. Uh, because remember, what they were translating for was really to get something in a library that included the, cult the Jewish culture. Okay, so this was their holy book, but they also included these historical books. Well, as we go through and we see these uh, the ecumenical councils that are done, and I have that in, in, in the Orthodox section, but th from 325 to 787 AD, there was these ecumenical Council, seven of them, where they were looking at these different books and um, what to include, what not to include. And we see that <clears throat> these councils, as they kept meeting, started to include more and more books into, and it was all that Old Testament period, uh, that, that 400 years. Now, the Roman Catholics accepted um, 46, which would have been seven additional books. The Orthodox belief, the scriptures are without error in matters of faith only. Scripture is to be interpreted by sacred tradition, especially the seven ecumenical councils which met in A.D. 325 to 787. So there was a, a period of time when they're trying to develop this canon. Um, and 49 books were included, three more than the Catholic Bible, and then 27 uh, New Testament books. Now. Two important things that you, well, uh, uh, you'll see that in, in these cases, who's the final authority? Is it the scripture or is it the church? Okay. This allows the church to be the final interpreter of the scriptures, meaning that, and you know, you ever wonder why it took so long for the Catholics to start to put the masses into common language. I mean, that wasn't done until, like, I think the 1960s. Everything was in Latin. And yet there are in all these nations. Why, why do you think that occurred? What do you think was happening there? Nobody knew Latin, so they didn't know anything about what, they were just being told what to, what to think, what, how, to, how their faith was, and boom, that's it. No, no, no need for a person to read the scriptures. And in fact, if you look at the history of the, of the Bible being translated, the church fought it totally from getting into the common man. They didn't want the common man to read the scriptures. Now why is that? Power. Power, okay, that you could say that, but it's also the fact that they believed they were the only ones that knew what the scripture was really saying. You laymen, you're going to interpret this differently and you didn't know anything. You didn't study, you didn't do all this and research this. And so it was what the church agreed upon as tradition would be the final authority. That's why the Pope is actually the final authority over the scriptures in the Catholic Church. What he says is actually considered higher than, uh, than, the, uh, than the scriptures themselves because he's the one interpreting, okay? And he'll tell you what scripture means in, in this case. And that's why you can get things as well. You know, it, it, it's like, and why do you think they lobby, politicians lobby the Catholic Church on changing their beliefs? Because they want the, they want the church to agree with them. Then they can say, hey, this is all... And, and if you look at the history of the Roman Church and the Orthodox Church, by the way, I mean, you know the Orthodox Church survived communism. Why is that? Okay, why is that? They survived because they didn't want any part of the government and they just left them alone and they weren't a threat. So they were allowed to exist. Um, and that's it. As long as they had the church was following what the communists said, they, don't, they didn't have a problem with it. They didn't believe it, but they were allowed to exist. But 
anything evangelical that got in there, all of a sudden there was a problem with with the communists and with Hitler also. I mean, that was. If you look at the history, you know, church and state being tied together, that's a lot of what's going on here. Uh, so the church could change its position, and you'll see this is why we have different positions at different times in history going on in these churches as to, they change, you know, for example, purgatory is talked about in these apocryphal books, praying for the dead. Uh, How's that come about? That it was it wasn't in the Roman Church until 1500. Okay, it's because the Church accepted that doctrine, and now it becomes a part of the belief system. So what I'm trying to tell you here is whatever you see in your scriptures does not necessarily mean that's why the Church is interpreting it. Baptism being a big item uh, in, in that period of time, especially, and as we get into uh, one of the early church fathers who talked about not having infant baptism, you can already see it was creeping into the church even around 150 to 200 AD. So that was, you know, that's how these beliefs started to get. And then how do you do that? You start to form, well, everybody agrees upon this, where everybody, and this is the, you know, the church fathers who were, you know, the early pastors at the time sort of got together and said, hey, this is what we believe. Well, we see that now, even in denominations. Uh, you know, we get together and vote on scripture, and that's what that says. That's not what it, you know, you may disagree, you, but this is what it says. But I think what the, uh, the thing got out of the bag, so to speak, once people started to fight for their right to have the scriptures interpreted and, 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 and you see governments overthrown during history and that's why you, you, you see a, a backing off of this but very very strict in how they didn't want the common man to try to even interpret the scripture they were the ones that were going to interpret and they were the final authority you'll see that in the Protestant Reformation there's a, a that Luther came up with scripture was the final authority Okay, not the church. That was the big battle line there because he kept studying the scripture. He says, that's not what it means. That's not what it says. Okay, and so that's where you, you get this difference, especially with Roman Catholicism and the Orthodox belief. And in that case, what you have is a total remaking of what baptism means. Baptism to them in the Roman Catholic Church is a means of having your infant really cleared of original sin. Now where did that get into the scripture? Okay, but that's what it means. In other words, that's why it's very imperative that that child be baptized. Okay, it's through sprinkling, the Orthodox do it through dunking because they, they still believe in that baptizo <laughs> immersion, okay? <laughs> so that's what we see there. Now in the Lutheran Church, scripture alone is the authoritative witness to the, to the gospel, okay? That's where Luther's influence is coming in now. Some parts more directly or fully than others, all of a sudden there's a qualification. Uh, conservative Lutherans view scripture as inerrant, Okay, meaning liberal uh, Lutherans don't. Okay, and what's inerrant mean? Infallible. Well, it's, it's along those lines, but in no error. Inerrant means they're without error. Okay, so, but then, you know, they, there's a qualifier there uh, with the uh, directly and fully than others. So, in other words, some scriptures above other scriptures. Um, <clears throat> The canon is 39 books of the Old Testament and 27 of the New Testament, which is the standard Protestant Bible. Where did that come from? Okay. Because you, you, you notice the 27 always remains the same. Okay. Okay. That was done by these councils. Okay. And basically what they did was what I would call the apostolic test. If it was written by an apostle, verified that it was written by Apostle. That's why you have Paul having as many books as he has. Peter, John, you have Matthew. Uh, Revelation was written by John. So as you're looking at that, you have a couple books there 
Luke, Mark, which we're studying. Um, we have Acts, you know, and then uh, Jude, James. Well, James wasn't, uh, no, 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 not the James that we're talking about. James wasn't an apostle. So what did they, what was the other criteria then that got those books into the New Testament? Remember, they're looking at just the apostles being the foundation. Well, Mark was, they believe, a relative of Peter. Okay, very closely aligned with Peter. Luke, obviously, was very closely aligned to Paul. He was his assistant. They, they feel that, and Luke was a very much a historian. I mean, he, all his facts are in their, their, their time tested as far as what he states, when it's stated, uh, it, it, and he does everything in chronological order. <clears throat> Um, so this was considered, well, they're closely aligned to the apostles. Now what about James and Jude? Who are they? James, the brother of Jesus. Jude was the brother of Jesus. Half, they were half brothers. Remember in the Gospels it said that James, and, well, the four brothers that he had didn't believe didn't believe that he was the Messiah. Okay. But after the resurrection, these two brothers did and became a very big part of the church. And in um, James's case, he was actually the leader of the Jerusalem church. Okay, and that's when we talked about uh, the Galatians and what was going on with, between Paul and the, the Jerusalem church as far as you know, the Judaizers trying to change what was going on, and they were, you know, it, it, the Jerusalem church, see, they're, they're still, they got that Judaism influence, and they were questioning Paul, well, you really, is this really of God? And so they finally met after that, and, and they finally agreed, yes, this is, the Gentiles don't have to become Jewish. Okay, that was really the big thing. Uh, so, but James was a real big part of that because he was a leader in the church at the time. Um, so I stray a little bit, but uh, anyways, the uh, item here is the fact that we have 27 books that are pretty much agreed upon by the whole church, that, and that was the basis of it. Okay, now we get to, and that was from the start, all these, uh, these seven ecumenical councils that they had, every one of them had 27 books of the New Testament. That, there was no, never a problem with those 27 books, with those councils. Now, I should say that before that, there was discussion about, well, was Second Peter really written by Peter? Was, you know, th these letters that were written as general epistles. But once they felt clarified on those issues, they, they settled on these 27 books. Um, then we have the Old Testament to consider. Well, that was actually a, a difference of opinion uh, between these economic, economic, e ecumenical councils. The early ones were where the Protestant Bible was. Okay, that's the 39 and the 27. It got added to later, okay, as probably the church fathers at that time started to say, hey, you know, maybe we should look at this or look at that, and that, that looks good. And so, I mean, that's basically what was happening through these uh, these councils and really um, what I probably you know they, they talk about the Catholic Church actually beginning pretty much with Constantine uh, when when the government and the church sort of molded together and there was no more persecution and it became the official religion at that point in time all of a sudden Constantine wanted to set up a hierarchy and that's how we get to the Pope you know, leader in the church, and, and then who goes down from there, the cardinals, all this good stuff. Um, that wasn't set up originally, okay, in the church for the first 300 years. It was set up really by a person who was a government, you know, government uh, guy who wanted organization. So he's saying, you know, he's making these suggestions. And so at that point, when they're doing their first ec ecumenical movements, 
it's pretty much still they, they know they want to go with the Palestinian Bible because that's what Jesus preached from okay and called the scripture there's never a reference in the New Testament from the apocryphal books Jesus never mentions them that's what was the clear defining point for those early councils if he didn't go back to them as scripture then they weren't scripture and the Jews never accepted those books as scripture that was the other uh, the defining point so what you had was now the church is coming in and, and they're looking at these books and they're saying no 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 man we we think there's some good there and I've even heard Protestant ministers of major denominations who will say yeah you know there's there's some good things that give you some it's not uh, conical, but it's still good, you know, and everything else. And I've even preached a sermon from those, <laughs> you know. So this is what you, you're getting. You're getting, well, we like that, so we'll maybe talk about that. Maybe there was a good lesson in there or something. But it wasn't scripture. It wasn't accepted as scripture. And Jesus never alluded to those books in his um, teachings or anything else like that when he talked about the scripture he's always referring back to the prophets Moses and not these other books so I think there was a defining difference at that point in time as it went along all of a sudden these things start to creep into the uh, church and remember the church is the final authority in these cases oh yeah we accept those books now Catholic Church seven of them Orthodox ten of them okay so it's like what was you know how, how did you come up with this so but I'm sure there was some way they but the church being the final authority over scripture could say hey we, we adopt those uh, so and there were practices in there that start this is what the church started to adopt the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church um, so we get down to the Presbyterian um, you can see what what they have there scriptures inspired and infallible the sole final rule of faith the Protestant canon is accepted but the PC USCA have liberalized which means that they don't accept the infallibility okay but you'll see in the reform movement they do accept this was John Calvin's sect the PC USA is really sort of branched off. They've really sort of disclaimed themselves from, from the conservative branch. Uh, so, and then in the Methodist Church, historical, uh, historic view is that scripture is inspired and infallible, the sole final rule of faith, the Protestant canon is accepted, United Methodists have liberalized. Okay, with, and I can tell you right now, one of the bis biggest things is the uh, uh, homosexual gay movement that has really upset the old apple cart in this case because they don't want to accept those scriptures and so they they start to liberalize this thing so that's you know you, you have you have a <laughs> in the old testament especially you have a real strong uh distinction about you know talking about uh the uh, homosexuality and everything else and you also have Paul talking about in the New Testament so they have a real hard time now they they have to start to pick and choose what they want to believe and what they don't want to believe um, and this is also occurring in Baptist churches so we can't we're not we can't say and and you'll see in, in scriptures inspired and without error sole final trustworthy rule of faith the Protestant canon is accepted but the mainline church is very in extent to which they view scripture is without error. Again, there's that homosexual, uh, you know, I mean, I, and have to, well, let's, let's put it this way. This church changed its association with the American Baptist Church to the conservative because of that whole issue. Because they were accepting some churches that were doing it. Now, they, they said, well, as a body, we still have a majority of people that don't believe that, but at the same time, they had these outlying churches that did, and they accepted them into their, their association. That was a problem uh, with what was going on even in the Baptist uh, 
movement. And I know that Southern Baptists are having some dealings with this too. So, and that's, that's a very large denomination. So if that happens, you know, basically it's, it's, it's a, the majority of Baptists then are becoming a liberalized type of uh, situation. Um, as far as their view of scripture. But you can see this view of scripture has a lot to do with what your theology is going to be. Okay, very important how that comes about. And that's why you can see these different beliefs in baptism, sacraments, everything. I mean, it's just like, you know, it's all across the board. You know, how do we go from two sacraments to seven in the Catholic Church? Okay, <laughs> that's because the church says we have seven sacraments, you know, for whatever reason. Um, and so this is what it really comes down to, is the fact that uh, how you want to interpret, and you got to remember, too, uh, a lot of this didn't change for centuries because people were kept in the dark because they never knew the scriptures. Only the church was teaching what they wanted to teach. And it was easy to keep people under their control. Now it's not so easily, easily done. People get, you know, they get word and, wow, that's different than what I've ever heard. You know, they, they hear the gospel for the first time in many cases because they've not been told the gospel. Uh, so, <clears throat> anyways, that sort of sum, uh, sums up <laughs> probably with what I see as time here. Uh, if we want to go into questions and still until we get into uh, the other, I, probably what I'll do is I'll read a little bit of the beginning just to maybe uh, whet the appetite here, but uh, we'll get into this next week. Um, I, I have just uh, the sources of Baptist perpetuity, and I have some uh, uh, books here that I had... Uh, shown and in the uh, I repeated them basically uh, as to what we're studying but we're probably going to go into uh, Spurgeon on Baptist perpetuity he has a nice little and you'll see it in your handout has a nice little thing about him looking at um, history and sort of telling the tale okay of how the Baptists have always been around in some form or whatever, but the church was trying to stamp them out, basically, because obviously the church was the final authority. <laughs> so these were, uh, you know, people who uh, weren't of their faith. So, uh, but uh, Spurgeon, now uh, going into Spurgeon, just a, a little bit, uh, read that information that I have on the outline. I was surprised. I, I knew of Charles Spurgeon. I knew he was a great English uh, Baptist minister, but I was totally surprised at how much of an influence he really was on the 18th century church. Uh, he basically, uh, you know, he, it was like a, a revival movement in England that carried over to the United States. Um, as far as uh, getting the Baptist movement and getting really what I would say Christianity the way it should be as I see it because you will see that he's he started something like 65 charities for the widows for the prostitutes for I mean he did where Jesus went is who he, pre, who he preached to uh, he had what you call the uh, the uh, you know the largest mega church at the time 6,000 members and you'll see that uh, he knew all his members by name. That's amazing. And that's truly, you know, you don't find pastors like, you know, <laughs> like that anywhere. I mean, but it's truly amazing uh, what he, uh, what he did. He personally baptized 15,000 believers during his lifetime. And uh, so, and they estimated that he preached the gospel to over a million people. Because he did carry, he wasn't just at his church, he was like, sort of like an evangelist also. But that's, you know, that, I'm throwing out those little tidbits for you. Because that's wh where we're going to go next with uh, Spurgeon. And he's going to explain his uh, thinking on um, how the Baptist came through. 
uh, history, and then we'll go to uh, early church father Tertullian and uh, talk about him. He's not truly what I would call of the Baptist faith, but he did speak about immersion and adult baptism. So that's that's why they call him the Baptist theologian, but he does not necessarily believe baptism the way we believe baptism. Okay, so we'll, we'll go into that. You'll see his history, brief history, bio, or whatever you want to call it, is also attached. So read that for the next time, and we'll uh, conclude there, and we'll get started on that next week. <clears throat>